Good evening. Um, Happy New Year. It's Tuesday, January 14th, and we're at the City Council meeting. And the first order of business would be the roll call. Bartlett? Here. Forsma? Here. Caravello? Here. Doom? Here. Kylie? Here. Kirsch? Here. Jensen? Here. Lagaki? Here. Fieski? Here. Reeves? Here. Riley? Here. Schumacher? Here. There are 12 alders present. Okay, thank you, Holly. Uh, we have a couple presentations tonight. The first one will be from TDS. Uh, they have a team here that will present. I think Josh is going to introduce everybody, and you can come on up. Um, slides are in your packet. Do you want this up on the screen? Oh, uh, yeah, you can put it up. And Good evening. I'm Josh Worrell. I'm manager of business development for TDS Telecom. I'm joined tonight by Aaron Way from marketing, John Deacon from NS, and Matt Schulte from our network services group. So between uh, the four of us, we're hoping to answer any all questions you may have tonight. We're going to be doing a hopefully short presentation. There's a lot of slides here. I'm going to brief breeze through them fairly quickly, but if you guys have direct questions or anything, feel free to raise your hand or throw something at me and I'll stop and address that question. So this is going to be a presentation on our plans for 2020 in Stoughton and our expansion for, um, into Stoughton and just a little bit about who TDS is as a company. Um, so here, we're, TDS is a Fortune 500 company. We're in 30 states um, across the United States. Um, we fluctuate between 540 and 5 20 somewhere in there so we're actually a fortune thousand company but we're a large company the seventh largest wireline um, company in the country that sounds large but the discrepancy for number seven and number one is fairly substantial so in the telecom space we're, we're a smaller um, smaller business so we're family we're publicly traded but family owned so that's a very unique uh, situation the company started 50 years ago um, um, our founder Roy Carlson um, bought and acquired ILEC properties are small phone companies, and the goal at that time in the company was to bring um, phone to the rural areas of the company and as we ex or country. And as we expanded, that also gave way to video, and then broadband, of course, is what people want today. You can see some of our accolades up there. We're very proud of our diversity and women in the workplace, and those are some of the most recent awards we've won over the past few years. This map here, um, that is uh, our territory. It's kind of hard to see, but if you look in, the, the footprints within those states are our ILEC properties in blue, and the pink is our cable properties. We're a unique company and a portfolio company in that we do cable and wireline. Uh, that's unique. Most telecom companies do one or the other, so we have experience in both, um, which is, is unique in that space. Um, you can go to the next slide. Um, so, how did we get here and why are we in Stoughton? TDS has, over time, pursued two pretty aggressive fiber strategies. And the last slide, all of our footprints across the United States were as economically feasible. We went to our own footprint and overbuilt our existing copper plant with fiber. Um, this is a way to future-proof that fiber to be able to offer the speeds um, and connectivity that people need today. In all of the areas that we did that, we saw tremendous success, well over 50% market penetration. So not only were we going to our existing places and building out, but if anything that's greenfield or new development, new construction, commercial or residential, we are building fiber into those today. The next one. So that helped us, um, that success drove, and we, our corporate parent kind of looked at that and said, hey, you had really great success overbuilding um, existing territories with fiber. What does it look like if we went to a city that had never heard of our who never heard of our company or had our service or knows nothing about and they're just used to their incumbent providers. What does it look like if we come in and overbuild for fiber? Go the next slide. I'll go one more. So enter Sun Prairie, Wisconsin. So in 2017, we started construction in Sun Prairie, Wisconsin. Um, this was an area we had never offered service before. Um, it's a town of about 30,000 people and 10,000 households. This was a unique situation in which they were actually already building their own municipal fiber network and they were in a couple neighborhoods um, trying to offer a different choice for, for internet. 
we came in and said, hey, you know, sell us your network. Uh, the issue they were happen is, having is they were very capital restrained. And it was going to take them about 12 to 15 years to build the entire city out with fiber. Um, so we said, hey, sell us the network. We'll do it in 15 months. So we started construction in May of 2017. We turned our first customer up in September. Um, December, by the time we shut down, we had launched every neighborhood in Sun Prairie except for four DFN areas. That's just um, what we call neighborhoods. Um, and it was a tremendous success. We launched those next um, neighborhoods the next spring. The total build was done in about 16 months, and today we have over 55% market share. Um, so we've taken that success and we've expanded our funnel, and we started looking for towns in and around Madison or our existing ILEC properties um, to do the same thing again. So as you can see up here on this map, um, the, in blue is our ILEC territories, and green have been our fiber expansion communities. Um, so we added four in and around Dane County, which was DeForest, Cottage Grove, McFarland, Oregon. We're also building Monona, which is not on that map, and now we're going to come to Stoughton. So in addition to these communities, we have also expanded the funnel, and we're doing a cluster in central Wisconsin that is comprised of Stevens Point, Wausau, um, we even launched our first out of Wisconsin, out of territory build in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. We started that in July, and we started turned up our first customer, I believe, in December of this year. So it's it's also been a great success. Um, this is the entire community benefits. Everywhere we go, we've targeted communities who have great demographics, great household growth, and that are underserved by the incumbent providers. Um, generally speaking, the communities we go to if you talk to the residents, they feel like either the cable company or the wireline company has a monopoly and competition is powerful. Um, and everywhere we've gone, we've proved that out. Uh, when we entered the Sun Prairie market in September, the incumbent cable provider upgraded their service from 60 to 100 meg, and then six months later for free upgraded it from 100 to 200. So um, the proof is there. Competition is powerful. And generally speaking, everywhere we go and do this, we see, we see tremendous results. This is a little video. If you guys have the packet, we can send you this link. It's on TDS Fiber website. We're not going to play it now. You can just we can send you that link if you'd like to view it later. It's mostly the benefits of fiber and what it can do to property values, what it can do for your community, what it can do for the city, just all the value values of fiber. Okay. Um, so um, Stoughton as a partner. So these fiber builds, um, we have to be very upfront and honest, these are stressful on the community. This is very difficult. We have to go through and actually lay fiber lines down every street and to every home. Uh, we'll be working in the right-of-way, we'll be working in the easement, and there's a lot of education with the residents on what an easement is, where the easements are. Generally speaking, we try, and we'll get more to this in the construction standpoint, we try to stay to the existing infrastructure, meaning if it's aerial today, or if the cable and wire or the copper phone company is on aerial plant, We'll be trying to stay aerial. If it's buried, we'll go buried. If it's buried in the front, we try to go to the front. If it's buried in the back, we try to go to the back. There are instances where it has to be different because there's either not an easement there or we don't have access there and we can't go. And we'll be taking those on step by step. We're going to have to be working very closely with not only your public works department, but Stoughton Utilities. And we've already had many meetings with them to help coordinate um, the aerial distribution, our fiber transport, which has already started work um, and will continue, um, and then the distribution, which is actually into the customer's house or, house or their backyards. Um, so communication between us and the city is, is key. Anytime we've had issues in and around communities involving our fiber builds, it's a breakdown in communication, um, and the city or the utility and TDS are not on the same page. So we'll be working very hard to keep you all informed, keep everybody in the loop, as well as your residents, to make sure everybody's on the same page about where we are, what we're doing, um, and how we're going about it. OK. I covered that. You can go to the next one. This is just briefly our mission values and what our company stands for. That's on our website. You can see there. But we, TDS preaches integrity, team above self, invest in people, sense of urgency, and be good citizens. So there's a lot of things. We've already had conversations with city officials. We want to be a good um, corporate partner for the city and invest in Stoughton. And we think this, this network is, is the way to do it. And there's some other relationship building activities that we have going on as well. That's our management team. Everybody here works for one of those people up there. It's our, it's our senior leadership team. 
and I'll let you cover that another time. That's our beautiful location in Madison on Junction Road. Does anybody have any questions? Yes. Yeah, I just wonder what it costs for us, for the city. What's our what's our cost, for both direct and hidden? Yep. So the direct cost is nothing. It's about, and we have a few slides coming up that handle the, the handle the costs and what the construction will entail. It's about a ten to twelve million dollar capital investment on TDS's part to put the fiber um, in throughout the right of ways in Stoughton to offer, and it will cover about sixty five hundred addresses. Um, so there are no direct costs for the city. However, there will be, I believe, some locate costs. Yeah, Digger's uh, Hotline. Yep. Yep. So Digger's Hotline. You know, we're going to be calling in locates, and we'll have to coordinate with your team on how we're doing that and where we're doing that. But you will see an increase in locate costs, and that's generally the only cost you'll have. The Digger's Hotline is um, law prevents us from recouping our costs to do that. Much of that work we subcontract out because we don't have the staff to do it all uh, internally. And any estimate, Mayor, about how much that would cost? I don't know what that cost is. I think that's something that utilities is working with. And we can follow up and get you that answer. Yeah, I would like to know how much it's going sure. to cost the city. How much is it for your cost again? It's about a 10 to $12 million capital investment. 10 to 12? Yes. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions and we'll keep going. Yes, ma'am, did you have one? Well, I was just wondering, I mean, if if you're going on people's property and obviously you have to, what prevents one of your competitors then to come in and do the same thing? <coughs> so if TDS comes in and then say Verizon or Spectrum comes in, it could be a never ending, you know, problem with our city where things being constantly being dug up are done so there's nothing that precludes anybody else from doing the same thing next year that's correct however um, we can't go everywhere we're, we're restricted to the street right-of-way or the easement in which we have to put so it's technically wouldn't be encroaching on people's property so we're there's specific places we have to go in regards to can anybody do this yes however once we over your existing incumbents don't have um, incentive to overbuild their existing plant with fiber. So they're not going to be coming in and doing any sort of construction like this on a large scale because they already have plant here. And they're not going to spend additional money when they can already offer service here. Other providers can do it. I would tell you that it's highly unlikely once we start building fiber here you would ever have another company come in to overbuild with fiber to the home because it just doesn't make sense to have that many um, there's no business case for that many competitors in one market. You may have one day Verizon coming in to do some 5G stuff, but it will not be as intensive as fiber to the home everywhere across the entire city. Uh, the second follow-up question, I know there, with 5G there, there's stated some potential health risk. Is there any health risk with your fiber at all? No. Sir, did you did I see a hand over here? Okay. Um, so the network will consist of about 95 miles of new conduit and fiber optic cable. 23 of that will be aerial plant. 72 miles of it will be buried. Um, and we will work with Stoughton Utilities hand in hand um, because there will be make ready and pole replacement costs that we will have to incur. In other words, when we go to put our infrastructure up on an existing pole, um, the pole has there's there's work that has to be done to assess if that pole can handle the additional weight. If it can't, that pole must be replaced. Um, that cost comes to us to replace that pole. Um, and then if the pole can handle the weight, there's then make ready work. Make ready work is basically just shuffling the existing facilities on the existing pole to make room for a new provider to stay within all of the code height um, limits. Um, this is just a few of the uh, pictures of some of the equipment we'll be using. Most of the buried work will happen with this directional bore rig. Um, all the aerial work will happen with a bucket truck. So this is some of the equipment you can expect to see in and around town. Some of this equipment you may already be seeing. Some of it, if it's on the outskirts of town, might be theirs. I know within town, especially on Page Street, I believe it might be Alliant that's been doing some work. So you've probably seen 
the, I think, what do they call it, a trencher? Is that what they call that? Yeah. Uh, ditch witch. Ditch witch. Yep, same thing. Plow. Yep. So you probably have already seen that, and some of the neighborhoods have already experienced um, some good, some not so good. Restoration is something that, you know, we're really going to focus on, and these guys are, you know, it's, it's in our guidelines of what the expectations are as far as restoration and timetables and them sorts of things. Um, some of that is in the application materials that we've approved here in the past. Absolutely. Restoration is always a huge, um, a huge conversation around the cities. Um, generally speaking, we try to give you as many resources as you have. The mayor has <coughs> my cell phone. We give you guys the resources between fiber tech and our network services groups. And then the residents will have phone call or numbers to call to be able to get directly to either FiberTech or our contractors um, with issues specific to their property so we can log those um, and avoid them during construction. So your, the construction partners that will actually be doing the work here in town, FiberTech Consulting will be the company that is helping manage or quality control our contractor. The buried work will be handled by um, NP Next Level and MyTech Services will be responsible for all of the aerial plant um, here in Stoughton. Um, so all of those companies, yes. One other question is, so fiber is different than cable? Yes. Because it's, it's, a, it's a different kind of material. So when this Digger's hotline goes to look at underground stuff, do they detect fiber? Yes. Uh, and, okay. It, I, it has a uh, uh, locate member associated on the, else, on the inside sheet. <coughs> So they can, they can detect. I have to say, I know very little about about fiber, and I and I, I, didn't, I don't don't know. There has to be some kind of metal because the the, the detectors are detecting, having detected. Yes, the the fiber facilities can can be located. And just to clarify, the three types of technologies: you have your phone company, who's using primarily copper plant or old copper wire, and they they've either bonded or done something to get higher speeds, you have coax, which is your cable company, and then we will be coming in with fiber, which is essentially glass, glass tube, and we transmit the data over, um, over light, um, and it works well with our IPTV product as well. Yes? Uh, can you explain your reasoning for not burying everything? Yes. Um, mainly it's because we found in a lot of the other areas, if you're currently fed off of a pole today, you don't have peds in your yard or if there's poles going through your backyard you don't have peds in your yard and if we change the infrastructure or go away from it um, we're adding peds or telecom infrastructure to your yard that wasn't already there so we're trying to be as least intrusive as possible um, and then it becomes a cost thing generally speaking aerial tends to be cheaper buried tends to be more expensive generally speaking that's not always the case um, there's some times in which there might need to be in a mile stretch if there's 50 poles that need to be placed in a row um, the stone utilities would come to us and say hey we, we have all these poles to replace they might not necessarily want to do the work to, repl to replace them all and it might be easier on us just to bury it for that stretch so generally speaking we try to follow the existing infrastructure but there are caveats to that and it's location specific <coughs> you can go ahead. Yeah. Oh, um, you may have already said this, and I lost it. But do you have a, a kind of a, a, a schedule? Is this like Sun Prairie, where you your your intent is to come in and build out the entire city over, say, a twelve to eighteen month period? And if so, what does that schedule look like? Yep. So, put a few slides forward, and let me see on the map. Oh, let me go back and let me click on that real quick. This is <coughs> real quick. This is just our construction um, notification doesn't really have any of our branding on it. We're not yellow, but this is meant so that residents can see it. They don't get thrown away necessarily. So this goes on everybody's door one to two weeks before construction starts in their specific neighborhood. We also have a mailer that looks exactly like this, and everybody will actually receive a piece of mail so we know we can verify that they got notice, notified that construction was starting. We've had these are 50-50. In the past, we've had people tell us, hey, I didn't get it, I did get it. The mailer ensures that we can say, hey, yep, we gave you notification, 
here it is. In addition to that, we'll be doing social media posts. We'll be taking out ads in the newspaper. We'll be doing as much as we can, possibly can to get the word out to what we're doing. Inevitably, people will call and say, I didn't get notified. We'll miss people. We'll try to do the best we can to get everybody, but some people will just miss it. Um, okay, I'll answer this guy, this search question. Um, so this is a overview. Those are tiny, sorry if you can't see that, DFNs, and that is going to be everywhere we are building fiber to the home, commercial, and residential. The answer to your question is yes, there is a schedule. We do not have a solid schedule yet on when service will launch in Stoughton. We know the transport construction, so there's two pieces, transport construction and distribution. The transport construction is going on now, and that is the ability for us to get network to Stoughton in and out. So it's a diverse network, meaning it's coming in and going out. So if a line gets cut coming in, it goes back around and gets fed. It makes the, the network very reliable. So you have um, good service here in Stoughton. That work's happening now through the winter. It's already getting close to being within the city limits. The distribution will start probably in the spring, April, May. That's when we'll start marketing as well, sending marketing to people's houses, letting them know what products and services are available. The reason we don't have a solid schedule yet is because it's primarily um, dependent on the make ready schedule. So we need to work with Stoughton Utilities to get them how many poles we're trying to get on. And we have that preliminary data to them now. And then we, they have to work, there's a lot of poll work that needs to be done to gather data on what polls need to be replaced, what polls need make ready, and then they do their due diligence on how long it's going to take to replace those, get that back to us, and from there we back into a schedule. So it's dependent on working with Stoughton Utilities on how quickly that work can be done. Um, the buried work will go a little quicker and, can, and will be primarily on us and we'll be able to turn up certain neighborhoods that are buried earlier than others, but we don't have a firm schedule yet, and we're hoping by maybe spring to firm up that schedule. Is that right? So around spring, by the time we get our website live and start marketing to residents, when you go online to tdsfiber.com and punch in your address, it'll bring in what little DFN or neighborhood you're in and when we expect to launch in that neighborhood. And the reason they're here tonight is um, originally, they were going to come in the spring in April, and with the favorable weather, they've been able to work ahead on some of the work, and they're getting closer to the city, and we just felt we wanted to bring them in here tonight so the council and the community kind of knew what was going on and what all these trucks were doing. And it's a pretty exciting thing for Stoughton. People that have used a fiber optic can certainly <coughs> appreciate the benefits of having that versus maybe something other than that. So. Um, that's kind of why we're we're having this conversation tonight, and we expect this to be an ongoing conversation. Did you have a follow-up? Just one more question. Yes. Um, so I'm the city attorney here in Stoughton, and I'm also the village attorney in the village of Oregon, where yes. TDS built out last year, I guess. Yes. And um, you you mentioned earlier that a uh, full build-out like this is kind of stressful yes. for the community and for you guys, I know. Um, one of the things I think TDS was able to do with Oregon, and I'm wondering if you can do it here, is uh, to have um, um, a dedicated person available for any calls to the community, public works department, clerk's office, wherever, for people in the community who are, who are calling because, gee, there's somebody digging in my backyard, what's going on? Mm -hmm. You know, someone at TDS who has authority, knows what's going on, who's available to handle all those calls. Is that something you think you'd be able to do uh, with uh, your build out here in Stoughton? So the number that will be on all of our flyers is directed specifically to IVR that's specific to Stoughton that goes directly to FiberTech? Correct. Goes directly to FiberTech who is QCing all the work in Stoughton. So and this it, is the same, same FiberTech that did Oregon? Yep. So same, so same crews that did Oregon, same um, managers. So if they call that number, they say, I'm at so-and-so address, leave a message, or if they get whoever's there, they will actually physically, if they need to, come out and you know, look at their property, say, oh, you got sprinklers here, you got there, and address those concerns. So yes, that number on the construction flyer is specific for Stoughton and will get you directly to the people that are managing Stoughton. Um, you also, through the relationships with the cities and the public work directors, will have access to John, Matt, and myself. Um, any issues that get out of control and get that need to be escalated can of course be escalated to me right away and we can figure out who needs to take take those on so we're we will be putting in place layers of resources for the city 
um, if residents um, need additional help or they feel like they can't get anybody at TDS, we're going to be providing those layers of resources for them, similar to Oregon, correct? Other person, Reeves, did you have a question? Yeah, I did. I just, um, in terms of the timeline and mapping, there is a map in here, but it's it's pretty tough to see any street names. So I just wondered, during the rollout, is there a map that could be maybe funneled through, whether it's public works, to be shared with council periodically that's specific so that we could look at it and say this is where they're at and this is where they're headed to help us understand so timelines and locations as far as the rollout? The answer to the specific maps is yes. So all of our permitting is going to have to be done through the city, and you'll actually get staking sheets which will specify exactly where the facilities will be placed, correct? So, so those sheets will be available to you guys. So if you want to get that granular and look exactly where the facilities are, you will have access to those staking sheets before we start construction because it has to be permitted through the city. Um, as far as like individual addresses, you of course will be able to go to tdsfiber.com, punch in your individual address and see what DFN you're in and see if you're in the build footprint. Um, but if you're looking for specific details, Yes, staking sheets are going to be provided throughout the permitting process um, because it has to be approved by the city before we can start construction. Yes. Have you considered a public meeting on this? I'm have sorry. You, did you, have you considered a public meeting to present this to the Stoughton residents? Yes. So throughout the build process at the beginning, we will do what we call fiber forums, and Aaron actually is involved in those, and we pick places that we can kind of fit large groups of people. We'll do different times. We'll send out social media blasts and invite people there to ask questions. We bring people from construction, marketing, sales, so we can cover kind of the gambit of questions that people might have. Um, so yeah, resources like that will be available. Those will be starting in the spring throughout the build process. Did you have something you want to add? Yeah, to just, it? just a little background <coughs> on our, our communication with TDS so far. We've had numerous meetings with, with the team from TDS about the build out. And as you mentioned, the stake, uh, staking sheets, we have those. Uh, we could share those with you at Public Works if you'd like, uh, periodically giving updates on where they're at, where they're going, and then at, at your direction we can bring that forward to Council and, and share that as well. Thanks. And uh, all the personal Gaki? Just a detailed question. The mayor used a term that I, I'm familiar with, fiber optic, and yeah. you're using the word fiber. Yeah. Are they the same product? They are the same thing. Thank you. Any other questions? or? Alder person Riley. Thank you. Uh, what percentage of households do you intend to um, serve ultimately? <clears throat> I think you used a percentage, and I didn't. I didn't catch it. I believe, and since slide, I believe we're going to cover 6,500 addresses throughout this build, and that'll be residential and commercial. And do you have any idea what percent? Well, the entire city then. Yeah, uh, I believe covered? it's the entire city limits. Is that correct? City limits, yeah. The city limits will be okay. covered. If you live outside the city limits, it's hit or miss on whether you are actually make it into one of those DFNs, but it will be the city limits of Stoughton. Thanks. And then with respect to the fiber optic, that is much faster than the product that Spectrum offers, if I understand correctly? So our entry level, so we do TV, phone, and Internet. Our entry level speed for broadband is 300 meg. It's symmetrical, so that's 300 up and 300 down. Yeah. And then our medium flavor is 600 meg, and then we offer a gig as well. Okay, and is that generally better, or excuse me, faster than what Spectrum offers? So I'm not sure what Spectrum's offering here. Mm -hmm. um, in Fitchburg, they offer 200 meg. So if they offer 200 here, then it, it would be faster, yes. The type of transmission, though, is generally um, faster than the coaxial. Am I correct, or am I wrong? Um, so 200 meg is 200 <coughs> meg. It's just the medium that that data is passing through. I, I'm sorry, I guess what I'm asking is, does fiber have advantages over coaxial with respect to how it delivers? services speed-wise, internet, et cetera? I would say my political answer to that is coax has, is a very substantial um, infrastructure for broadband. The fiber would have more capacity than coax, um, and generally the term we use is it future proofs your community. Um, so once we put the pipe in the ground or put the glass in the ground, uh, 20 years from now, if 5 gig is now what 100 meg is, we would change the electronics in your house and change the electronics on our back end, and the pipe can handle the capacity. Um, so it, it, has, it has advantages over coax, yes. Thank you. Way too technical for me. <laughs> Wait, I've got one more technical. I figured that was coming. Go ahead. So because you're splitting your network up between buried and aerial, 
and that in the aerial one um, you know obviously we had, like last year we had a pretty good storm knocked out some of our power lines and things like that are you setting your network up as as a noted network so that you can redistribute or how well there there, there will be rings set up internally so we have a ring we have a transport ring out of stone going towards oregon we have another going towards mcfarland so we have that redundancy there internally in town we have six excuse me we have six nodes that we're setting. We are building an internal ring within the city limits themselves for that redundancy as well. Where, uh, like, where would you house these nodes? I'm assuming they're probably not, they're not real large, but. Uh, it's kind of like a large refrigerator, if you right. will. Um, five, out of, five out of the six right now we have easements for, where we approach the uh, private parcel owner. So we have those pretty much nailed down so far. Okay. You can, the city has those locations mm -hmm. already, so they're they're aware where we're placing those, and we've worked with them to place them in a spot that works well for us based on our network and the spot that works well for the city. Okay, thanks. Did you I'm have any more, or do you want to I'm sensitive to your guys' time, so I mean, this, there's slides, but that's the general gist, is we're very excited to be coming and expanding to Stoughton. Um, like I said, construction distribution will be starting in the spring when it gets a little warmer. Transport construction is starting now. We're going to be doing our best to notify residents, and you'll be getting our marketing in the mail in the spring. Um, but we're very excited about it. Um, we think it's great for Stoughton. We think it's great for TDS. We're excited about our expansions all over the country. Um, and we, of course, will be available to come out here and answer any more questions that you guys have. Um, but I'm sensitive to your guys' time, and I know we have other presentations. So do you have any other questions for me tonight? Anything you want to add, Brad? Or they've been very upfront with us about what they're they're doing and their intentions, and so far so good. Um, we've stressed to them that the restoration is key, um, and they appreciate that. So essentially, the, the proof will be in the pudding. Uh, but we're you know excited to have them and work with them here in Stoughton. Okay. All right. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thanks for having us. Thank Brad. you. Thank you. All right, we'll have one more presentation and then we'll go into communications and we'll see if uh, Park and Rec Director Glenn can top that one. <laughs> okay, I thought, I thought it was a good time to come and give a little update on this project uh, considering in a couple of weeks, uh, January 29th, we're going to have a public presentation at the high school. Um, it's at 7 p.m. and uh, Gary Lacey, the engineer for the Whitewater Park aspect of it, he'll be in uh, Stoughton that night. So you can go to the next slide. So I get a lot of questions when I first talk about people what we're trying to do, and they think we're I'm crazy. So this is a great video I found um, that's based on the Iowa Whitewater Parks, and it's uh, two minutes, and I think it explains uh, everything that they they did and uh, what it accomplished. Muted in the video player. Yep, I thought this was the dumbest bleep. Sure, <clears throat> Iowa. You probably think this, 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 some of this. But what about this? We don't have natural white water, we'll build it. 
Iowa, huh? Yeah, you guys got a couple of parks out there. So we're getting around. Iowa, and the country as a whole, has a dam problem. Dams are bad because they're really dangerous. People die on them every year. But there is a solution. You guys have this dam. It's breaking down on you. This is what we think you should do. And it's tear them down and replace them with whitewater parks. There were a lot of people saying, this is nutty. What kayakers? Where are they? And he said, when they first brought this idea up, I thought this was the dumbest bleeping idea. We met with about 80 people. 40 of which were fishermen with pitchforks and torches. We're the most altered state in the United States. So our rivers and our streams are really our last wild spaces. What you're seeing is people coming out, building that relationship with their environment again, to get people to come back in the water and play. It's part of a nationwide movement to remove dams. And it's bigger than just riding rapids. This movement that's starting, that we can actually do some river restoration, some in-stream work to provide quality fish habitat, water quality improvement, and potentially a recreational opportunity, turns a patch job, essentially, into something that's going to bring money and, and tourists and opportunity back into that community. And some of those same fishermen have come up to me. They're like, well, I was one of the fishermen at that original meeting. And you're like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I've actually had guys come up and say, hey, listen, I'm sorry, you know, for, for opposing it so strongly at the time. He says, we just didn't know, and thank you for doing it. Go back on a nice sunny day, and there's now hundreds of people. He said it was a transformation. This is running. This ribbon of gold has been going through this community for centuries. And it's something that they can be proud of and that people want to go see. And if we can do that in Iowa, we can do that anywhere. Iowa. You probably think that Okay, so here, here's a quote. I, I talked to the mayor of Salida, Colorado about their uh, their park there and it's it's basically their like you said, it's the economic hub for the region. They have a giant uh, festival that's centered around the river and it's their city social center. So you know what well, is it really a social activity? It is because if you look at these types of parks, for every one person that's in the water, there's two people outside of the water. But it also gets it also gets people uh, into the area and using the park too outside of the water. So I'm going to give a little timeline that gives the background of where we got, where we started, and where we are today. So. In uh, November 2016, uh, there was a citizen in the community who actually came to our office and talked to former director Lynch and myself. And she said she knew we were trying to like approve the use of the river recreationally. And she said that we really need to check out the places in Iowa that have whitewater parks. And we're like, whitewater park in Iowa? We sort of had the same reaction as the people in the video. So over the next course of like 12 months or so, I, we did a lot of research and looked at them, talked to. Uh, Two of the leading engineers, Gary Lacey, one of them, uh, Scott Shipley would be the other. They built the most whitewater parks in the country. And, uh, you know, is this something that we can do here in the river? Does it have the capacity to do it? And uh, both of them said yes. Uh, you know, it would be possible to do it. Um, so, next slide. So that that pretty much, and then we also did research on, like, the benefits of the parks, you know, how what they've done to other communities. and. Um, if this is worth the idea, worth exploring more. So uh, January 2018, I had a meeting with the uh, DNR officials. The uh, waterways director was in Stoughton and also the secretary deputy uh, for the southern region. And uh, we did a site tour of the area. And, um, you know, I asked them, is this something that we could do in Wisconsin? And uh, at that, I got some good feedback from them. So at that point, uh, you can go to the next slide. Um, we decided to move forward with a concept plan for the park, and that's a picture of the concept plan. And uh, May 2018, uh, Gary Lacey came to the city, or Stoughton, and we had a presentation in the Opera House. If any, I don't, I'm sure some of you attended. It was really well attended by uh, the community and the Dane County area, uh, especially the paddlers. And uh, I would say the lower level was mostly full. So. Um, at that point, we had some more decision to move forward with the, the, with the project, um, and we created a steering committee. So, between the first steering committee meeting and the end of the or in the concept plan, so in that time frame, I went to other uh, organizations uh, such as uh, Madison, uh, 
uh, sports, uh, Madison Area Sports Association, or, or the, it's a, I forgot the name of actually the group, but it's the, they run Ironman and uh, other major events in Dane County. And uh, it's organizations like that and recruited members for the steering committee. So uh, the steering committee has uh, Padler, it's actually the city attorney. Um, Regina has been on there since the beginning of it. Uh, we have a RDA member. Um, we also have a River, Rivers and Trails Task Force member that's on it. Uh, so we have all these different aspects of uh, stakeholder groups that are represented in the steering committee. So they were tasked with the, with the, um, with uh, moving or making the major decisions of the project. So uh, one of the major decisions uh, during this time frame was, you know, what are we going to do with the design of the park? So before that decision was made, uh, there was an event that's not actually not on this timeline, but um, last summer there was a kayaker paddling down the Hare River who actually got pinned under, or not pinned, but sucked underneath the dam came out and, and luckily they survived the event but um, that really I think sat or was always in the back of everybody's mind on the steering committee so um, when we were moving forward with the project they decided to, to make a dam out design option and that was a major influencing point but there's other benefits and things uh, we also had communities uh, our community members from other places have gone through dam removal, such as West Bend, and uh, we had the Manchester um, project manager come or call into our meetings, and they gave us their experience with these types of designs. So um, that led them to really make the dam out decision as far as the design from the concept plan. So you can go to the next slide. So. Um, Here's some of the, like a timeline of the work that we've done this year. So this is a picture of uh, Interflu, who was tasked with uh, doing the sediment sampling in the mill pond. Um, the sediment sampling report came back earlier this, in like September time frame of this year, and uh, we had a meeting with the DNR shortly thereafter. And uh, you know we didn't know it was actually going to be in there. It could be like a, a scheme stopper basically for us if. We, it was really contaminated, but um, the DNR says it's typical of an urban environment and it's nothing going to set the project back. So uh, it, it's looking like uh, that we can, the water levels will drop and that we could cap the area that's contaminated with uh, uh, several different things, but it's, it doesn't need to be removed from the site, which would be the big cost. Um, <coughs> with a dam with decision, also uh, recreation engineering and planning, Gary Lacey's uh, company, did uh, the prelim design and hydraulic analysis for it. And like I said earlier, you know, we're, we're going to have a public meeting on January 29th. So this is the, this is the preliminary design of, the, of the, the park. So you can see that the mill pond, there's a lot of area that's exposed uh, and that's likely to be capped. And then there's, the dam would be modified so that you'd have a surfing wave and there'd be a southern channel which would allow kayakers to get through and uh, there is enough head clearance with normal flows to, for a, cat or a paddler to get underneath the bridge and there to be two bigger, uh, two larger features uh, downstream of 4th Street. Um, so the hydraulic, back to the hydraulic analysis, this is what it's saying with the design. So. Uh, there, we would see a 2.9 foot water level drop at Main Street. One, then the, the water levels, the impact is lessened the further upstream you get. So it'd be 1.3 at Fortin Street, and then one foot at Scotland Road, and Lake Guns Dam would be a quarter of a foot. Um, that is under normal water flows. Uh, the 10-year average is 380 CFS, but uh, I think Brett can attest to this, that uh, that's that would be like our bowl probably of the last few years. I think they're usually flowing much higher. So the water impact, uh, the, the drops would be less than that. Uh, and this is, this is a, a depiction of what the river would look like um, with the, the design. So upstream, up into Main Street. And the engineer is actually working on doing Main Street right now from Main Street to uh, 
the Cooper Causeway Pedestrian Bridge, the railroad bridge area. So we would know what the river would look like in the entire stretch of the city. Um, the depths, so the darkest shade would be four feet. So right now it's like seven or eight feet in the middle pond. It would go down to four feet. Um, the permitting, so the way that the DNR permitting and the Army Corps of Engineering permitting work is that you do the permitting through the DNR here and then they work with the Army Corps to permit the project. So in some states, they're separate, they don't work together, so there'd be two different uh, permitting processes, but uh, the DNR has told us that they, the Army Corps works through them. Um, so one of the things we had done too, is we had uh, economic impact analysis done for the project. And um, this was done by the University of Wisconsin, and we didn't pay them anything to do this. So when the, the, per, the professor who worked on this he told me he's going to be conservative with his numbers. He said if you paid a consultant, they can make up any numbers that you know you'd want to sell the project. But he goes, he's not in that business. He wants his numbers to be really solid and be actually real realistic. So what it's showing is that uh, other whitewater park parks that uh, are have a lot of features and they're really nice, they can get uh, people to travel from 120 minutes away to visit them. Um, so the map on the right is uh, 120, 60, and 30 minute drive time. So if, well, the way the uh, project is now, I, we believe that we could be good people on the, one, the 120 minute uh, drive. So they've, these are some quotes and uh, they really, what these do is they really spur economic development. You got a lot of tourism going on in your downtown from visitors coming to use the park and you know, they're going to stop at a bar or a restaurant to have a couple beers and a burger, you know, spend 30, 40 bucks and get a tank full of gas. And if they're staying overnight, they're going to be staying in the hotel. Um, and I thought this was an interesting quote on the bottom from the RDA survey from the downtown ad hoc committee. And uh, people want experiences when they visit downtown, and this is giving them an experience. So the next few slides are just some benefits of these types of projects. So um, there's some environmental uh, benefits. So this is Woolen Mills Dam in West Bend, and they removed the dam and they created a park. So this is the dam removal, one week after the dam removal, and then 12 years later, they have a great park in uh, their city. Um, so one week, you know, it looks pretty bad. You see it looks like a mud flat, but uh, just looking at some several pictures that DNR has of dam removal projects, within six months there's a lot of vegetation already growing. Um, this is an example of a surfing wave, and like I said in the beginning, you know, there's, you can see there's only a few people actually using the water, and there's multiple people outside of the water watching them. And there's also, it seems like everybody that has one of these parks has a festival um, you know, that goes with it. And uh, obviously if you're getting people outside moving, there's going to be some mental health benefits too, as, long, as well as the physical health benefits. Um, then, uh, like I said about the, the paddler last summer um, going under the dam, uh, this is a dam modification. So the, the engineer wants to keep the foundation of the dam in place instead of taking it off and basically the same exact thing as the cost savings measure. Um, but the, the top two uh, picture graphics, the one on the right is like our dam here. The one on the left is a called the Lowhead Dam. Those are more dangerous, but there is some safety risk with having a type of dam like we had. So if the paddler kayak would have got stuck in there, it could have been pretty bad. Um, so obviously there's some other recreational things. So we're, we're hoping the, the big, the big term plan is to uh, connect us to the lower here river trail that comes into the city. Uh, the video on the left can be found on our website and it's a video from Trota Limited on how the fish passages work and the fish habitat from these types of projects. Um, I got these from Brett, and these are sort of, you know, a lot of people, a lot of places I've gone through dam removals do it as a cost saving measure, believe it or not. So there's some costs uh, associated with actually operating the dam and keeping the dam. So we just, Brett said, Brett told me that they just had the dam inspected, it doesn't need any repairs. 
uh, I don't know, is that 10 years? Yeah, every every 10 year, uh, 10 years, because it's a low hazard dam, we have an inspection that's done with, by an engineer. We just had ours done um, in September. Um, so the cost was, was you know, relatively minimal for that inspection. But if there were any major repairs, those can become quite costly. Uh, luckily, our, our dam is in relatively good shape. Uh, we had very minor things that we had to repair, you know, a few loose uh, bolts and things like that. Uh, but our major cost is really our, our, uh, our staff time. It's a 24-7 operation. Uh, we monitor it constantly and make adjustments as, as needed, uh, whatever time they're needed. Uh, so our, our costs are about you know, just, uh, just shy of $9,000 to operate the dam uh, with our staff. But then the, la the last time the dam was repaired, it was roughly $500,000 to repair the dam. So here's, here's some of the next steps that we need to do for the, the project. So there's a title search for like the exposed area in the mill pond um, to see who actually owns that piece of property. Sometimes it's the, the dam owner, sometimes it's the pro adjacent property owner. Uh, either way, it would be in a floodplain. You wouldn't really be able to do anything with that land. You could put a trail in there or something, but um, you're not going to be able to put actually a building or something there. Um, uh, we'd have to do restoration and remediation plans, uh, the final design, uh, the the trail design and the engineering for the REA property is really going to be driven by the stormwater from, by the developer, uh, fundraising for the project, and uh, if we were going to have a rental operation for the, the park. So one thing I didn't mention is that these things are, these parks are completely free to use uh, because it's uh, the waters of the public. So you can't charge to actually use a river, it's an in-stream. It's not creating an artificial channel like Wausau is. But uh, other places recoup a lot of the exp expense through a rental operation, either contracted out or run by the actual municipality. So you can find a lot of this information. I updated the project's website. It's uh, stotonrec.com slash uberpark. And there's a lot of different videos, a lot of different documents. Um, that, that's the link. Otherwise, you can always email or call me. Um, if, also, if you wanted to, the mayor of Salida, too, gave me his personal cell phone number. And asked, if anybody had any questions about their park and what it's done for their community, he said to give it out. So I didn't want to post it in a public meeting. But uh, <laughs> so, but he's, he's, a, he's a business owner, too. It's what he did before he actually became mayor there. So I mean, if I think he was part, pretty integral in actual the building of the park there. Any questions for Dan? All of Chris and Riley, and then Borsma. Thank you, Mayor. Hey, uh, one, thank you for all this work, Dan. Two, I, I'm really excited about this. I think that this is really important. I hope we get this done. Um, having said that, I thought uh, when, during our meeting there was discussion with respect to where we are on the dam, the cost of that, if the, what we have to do vis-a-vis -vis the DNR. Could you get into that just a little bit? Am I, you know what I'm, with yeah, respect so to adjust, et cetera? So there's a municipal dam program for dam removals. Um, the DNR is considering this a dam modification, not a dam removal, because we're, not, we're trying to keep the foundation as a cost-saving measure for the surfing wave. Uh, the mayor and I have a meeting with our local state representative to see if uh, we could change some things, and then the city attorney is looking at the administrative code that, that the DNR referenced in their judgment. Uh, uh, Dan, what are, what are the implications for the canoe race? I'm <laughs> on, on set of mind. Well, faster, yeah. Than a race? <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the general sentiment, um, I mean, Rivers and Trails Task Force, Joni Dean, who runs the canoe race, she's part of the Rivers and Trails Task Force, and we've talked about the project there, and uh, Bob Diabel is a canoe ra racer. And uh, they, I think they both think it's going to be a little bit of highlight. Maybe you could finish the race underneath the pedestrian bridge instead of where it ends now. Um, so quicker. It'd be a little quicker, yeah. <laughs> you end with a bang. <laughs> a little bit, little bit of excitement at the end. I, don't know. I mean, it's a, it's a sacred event in, in Soton. I have this way of raising. <laughs> well, we thought about that and we t discussed it. And when we had actually the people that organized it and Bob Dybel, he said, no, it's actually going to be a lot more fun and people are going to actually, because you end up 
at the end being a little bit challenged and a lot more fun. It's people are really going to come out and watch them go through the rapids, and when they end it, it's actually going to be probably a better event. Any other questions? Otherwise, Dan's always available if something comes up. So I did, one thing I didn't talk, touch upon was um, the Man Park Master Plan. So there's a, a draft preferable plan that's uh, on our website. It's our regular main page, stotenrec.com. You can review it, and you can there's a survey you can take to give additional feedback. So if you'd like to do that. So the, the consultant working on it, has, uh, there's been some coordination as far as with this project and the Man Park. So there's some access points in Man Park to get to the river. Okay, thank you. Okay. All right. Um, <coughs> do we have any communications from Alders this evening? <coughs> Alder Chris Lagaki. Just a quick one about um, community affairs and council policy. Um, you might have read in our minutes that we're just trying to be a, a starting point. Um, a clearinghouse, an area for when air, uh, issues of sustainability and energy targets and the like are on uh, the forefront or part of agendas. Um, we've now sort of organized that as a part of our work of that group. Um, who knows if it'll stay at community affairs and council policy, but the reality of climate change and everything that's going on, we thought we should have it sitting at a place of our local government. So I wanted to make you guys aware that that's a increased focus of the work of that committee. Okay, thank you. Hello, Chris and Caravello. Um, I just want to mention, I'm sure most of you are aware, but tomorrow night at 7 p.m., Dane County Parks is having a informational meeting at the Pleasant Springs Town Hall on County Highway N regarding the next piece of the Lower Yahara River Trail, which will connect, um, I think, the end of Williams Drive and the State Park over to Fish Camp Park on the north side of the lake. So that's tomorrow night at 7. Thank you. Any other communications? Um, I have a quick one. Uh, there's a um, hundredth anniversary at the Mother Post, and that would be the Stoughton VFW, and that is this Saturday. Uh, the festivities begin at four with an open house. There will be a ceremony at five, live music, and all sorts of fun. So if anybody's available, I'm sure they'd love to see you out there. I know I'll be there. Um, anybody else have any communications? All right, we'll get into some business here. There's a proclamation for Sons of Norway in the packet, and we'll get into uh, minutes and reports are in the packet. And it takes us to public comment. We do have one person signed up for public comment, and that would be Crystal Welsh. Come on up. Hi. Hi, how you doing? Good, how are you? I have to adjust that mic a little bit. Okay. There you go. I'm Crystal Welsh. I am currently the president of the Taste of Stoughton, which hopefully you guys had a little bit of uh, pre-information on. Um, I'm just here to talk about it briefly and answer any questions quickly. Um, the main purpose of this event is last year we started and we paired this up with the Madison Area Builders Association, which I'm on their board of directors. I'm also on their Pray to Homes committee. Um, so we paired up with them. We had a huge success rate as far as the highest um, attendance pray to homes um, it was over it was close to 70 percent higher than any other like top attendance number because of the taste of Stoughton so um, we branched off of uh, MABA MABA because they are not doing a uh, parade site this year so um, we got a committee together and um, basically it's just to showcase local Stoughton restaurants to Stoughton and surrounding communities. Um, we had two bands last year. This year we will have three bands, um, 11 to 8 p.m. Um, we have a completely fenced off area, about 1,200 linear feet of fencing. Um, we've got ID checks um, provided by, I've been in contact with Teresa Pellet from the Stoughton Co uh, Wellness Coalition. Um, so we went through obviously the public safety committee meeting. Um, we have plenty of staff that we're going to have the day of, volunteers the day of. We are currently a 501c3 status pending for approval. Um, so we got all that paperwork in uh, before the end of the year. 
Um, we're looking to have food vendors. We've had such great support from the local restaurants. Um, we had 10 vendors last year, and we've already had a handful reach back out to us, including ones that couldn't make that one month deadline that I pulled it all, we pulled it all together in a month last year. So this year we've been, we've been planning, <coughs> I think May, you know, this last May. So definitely a lot more time, um, even considering non-food vendors to be a part of this event as well. So um, obviously we uh, are having a Nordic Ridge um, Park this year is kind of our destination. Um, so you have the splash pad there. There is possibility we might have a bounce house, um, but the park is supposed to be completed by the time of this event in June. That's what we're told by Bob. Um, so just, it's gonna be family friendly. Um, we want people to come with blankets, chairs, and really just in, enjoy the community together with local vendors and uh, like I said, surrounding communities. Um, we're working with all local people. So we have a local, you know, um, our insurance bank, and we've got a lot of stuff in line. So I'm just really excited. I moved here in 2008 and I haven't left. So I just love Stoughton. Um, I grew up in Mineral Point. It remi reminds me of Mineral Point. So I love, this is a great city and I want more people to kind of know about it. So any questions? Thank you. It's great. Excellent. Thank you. We'll be talking about this. June 20th, sorry. Yep. We'll be talking about this uh, shortly. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> okay. Anybody else wish to speak at public comment tonight? Seeing none, we'll go into the consent agenda. There's three items in there. I'd entertain a motion. Move to approve. Motion by Jensen. Is there a second? Second. Second by Alderperson Bartlett. Would anybody like anything removed from the consent agenda? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? None opposed. Uh, that's approved. I'd like to just skip to new business for a couple items quickly and then we'll go back. Um, R3 of 2020 is, um, is the recommendation for the taste of Stoughton and that comes from Public Safety. Alderperson Jensen. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Public Safety presents uh, Resolution 3, 2020, authorizing directing and proper city officials to approve a temporary Class B beer and Class B wine retail license, a special event license for Taste of Stoughton, and I would move for approval. Second. Motion by second, and a second by Bartlett. Um, is there any discussion? All the person Yeah, it is. Yeah. Well, you heard the presentation here um, and the public comment. Um, the chief is not here, but we did not have any um, any issues from the previous uh, Taste of Stoughton, so everything was in order. So yeah. Biggest problem last year was really windy that day. Yeah, yeah that's true. <laughs> Alder person Borsma. Yeah, once again, I, um, I, I this this will be involving, I'm sure, um, kids um, and uh, being available during you know during the sale of <coughs> of, uh, of beer and uh, wine. So I will be uh, voting no. Okay, thank you. I think I think the culture of our city is to, is changing into more and more um, um, having fun by the use of alcohol, and I uh, think it it's something that we have to be careful with. So. All right, thank you. Any other questions or comments? Hearing none, all in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 And any opposed? No. And that motion carries. Uh, we'll go to the next item, which is R4 2020, and that also comes from Public Safety. Alderperson Jensen. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, <clears throat> Public Safety presents uh, Resolution 4 2020, mm -hmm. authorizing and directing the proper city officials to issue a Class B fermented malt beverage license and a Class B intoxicated liquor license for tailgaters of Stoughton LLC. Uh, Chad Strutzel agent uh, doing business as tailgaters of Stoughton located at 151 East Main Street I move for approval second second by Alderperson Riley Alderperson Jensen um, yeah a change of ownership so there needs to be a change of the um, agent okay. any questions or comments on this one I just just let everybody know that I'll be abstaining on this one okay all right any other questions or comments from Alders what was the difference in the, you had a 4-0 vote on that one, but on the same day on the one above it, you had a 5-0 vote. What, 
said. I think there was a member that was late to the meeting, so they didn't okay. vote on that. That was me. <laughs> Sorry to call you out. Uh. It was work. It was work. Honest. <laughs> we excused her. Silk showed up. She got caught in traffic or something. Perfect. All right. Uh, all in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 Any opposed? I abstain. And one abstention. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for waiting tonight. Hopefully you enjoyed the presentations. <laughs> yeah. All right. Take care. Uh, we're going to go back to old business then. Uh, we have a second reading, reading of Ordinance 27 of 2019. That comes from Public Works, Alder Person Bartlett. Ordinance 27 of 2019, repealing and recreating the Section 58-6 and 58-8, creating Sections 58-12 and 58-13, the City of Stowe Municipal Code, relating to public nuisances. And I move to approve. Second. Second by all the person, was it Reeves? Yeah. Okay. All the person, Bartlett? I would turn this over to Public Works Director to explain this a little more. Yeah, between myself and, and uh, Matt. Um, so essentially, uh, when it comes to trees on private property, uh, our current ordinance really does not offer us much language in how we are to go about handling those situations. Uh, so our current ordinance essentially states that uh, trees which are a menace to the public safety or are the cause of substantial annoyance to the public are a, a, a nuisance. So that's up to interpretation. It really gives us no guidance in how we treat trees on, on private property. Uh, so we worked with, with Matt and his firm on coming up with language that uh, offers us some protection and some guidance on how we treat those situations. Um, so basically, uh, Jamie, I don't know if you queued it up or not, but um, I have a short <laughs> presentation, another presentation on uh, kind of where we're at with, with uh, the process and how we, we treat these things. Uh, when it comes to the noxious weeds, that's another part of this. I'm not sure if Rodney can speak to that after, after this, but what we're looking at is how we deal with the, the tree aspect of it. Uh, so 5812 is essentially in addition to the ordinance so that deals with disease infested or dangerous trees or other plantings that are a nuisance. Next slide, please. <coughs> so basically, this is broken down into disease infested uh, trees um, or dangerous trees as defined in section 5812C, which is in your packet, or other plantings. Um, so I, I made these different colors because they are different in how we would treat them or go about um, acting upon these situations, and I'll get into that in the next slide. Um, but essentially, uh, you could read this for yourself, but essentially if there's um, a tree that is diseased um, or may be dangerous, there's a definition in the ordinance about dangerous tree, which basically if it can fall or may fall on city property, uh, public property, is deemed a, a dangerous tree. So this is basically how we'd go about uh, if a notification was brought to our attention about a tree on private property, uh, we would determine first if it was diseased or infested, uh, then we would be able to, to take some action to prevent the further spread of, of disease in our urban forest. Um, if it was a dangerous uh, tree as defined in the ordinance and may fall on public property, so any public rights of way a park, a public building, a sidewalk, street, things of that nature, we would be able to take action. If a tree was, was simply dead on private property but posed no threat to the public, uh, we, would be a, we would not take any action. Uh, the biggest thing that we talked about with our council is, uh, uh, legal council, that is, is entry onto private property. We have we had some reservations about doing so, um, the castle doctrine and things like that. Uh, so I, I'm not going to put a flak jacket on, but uh, you know, and we, and we respect private property as well. And so the, the discussion was how far as a municipality do we take, uh, take the, the ordinance to, to, to enter into private property. I'm not sure if you want to speak to, to that. Matt or not, or if I kind of covered it. I think you covered it well. I mean, I'd be happy to answer questions, but okay. you covered it well. We took that, that aspect very seriously about going on to private property. 
What is that, like a Fourth Amendment thing? Is that what that is? There are certainly Fourth Amendment issues uh, in terms of uh, going, you know, it, we, we can't just go on to people's private property um, without uh, um, addressing Fourth Amendment <coughs> issues. So we, we've provided some guidance to the city on how to do that as well. Because a lot of these things are residents calling on their neighbors because there's a, a tree that's, that's dead and they want it gone. And they want the city to play, you know, the, the mitigator to get that that done. And we don't feel comfortable, essentially, in a civil matter, uh, being that that mitigator. Next slide, please. Uh, so just just an example, you know, Dutch elm disease. If it's, uh, you know, there's a disease that may uh, spread to other trees, we can take action. Um, this is just an example of, of one of those diseases, which is Dutch elm disease. Um, EAB is, is obviously a thing that's here and is kind of gone. So we would treat EAB as it's not really an imminent threat at this point. It's already, the wave is already here and gone, whereas Dutch elm, that can spread more readily. And we re rely on our, our city forester to make those assessments. Uh, we do have a, a tree risk assessment that he would do on each one of these complaints um, and then use that as a guideline moving forward. Next slide, please. Uh, dangerous tree, which is the other aspect of this. Uh, so if it's a, a dead tree, um, it's likely to fall upon a sidewalk, street, or other public property. Uh, just to protect the, the public, we would be able to take action in that regard. Evaluation of the tree on private property, as I stated before, we'd use uh, the basic tree risk assessment form. Uh, this is a process that was uh, developed by the International Society of Arboriculture, so it's not something that we made up. This is a, a vetted out form um, because we don't want to be in the business of, of playing favorites. We want a form that we can uh, arbit not arbitrarily, but but. Uh, uh, systematically go through the, uh, the analysis of that tree uh, without any bias. Uh, when it comes to the abatement, uh, if we uh, went down the path of we determined that there was a disease that we did not want to spread or it was a dangerous tree that affected uh, public property, we would notify the property owner in writing. Uh, we would uh, require that removal no less than 14 days, so we would determine uh, how long essentially we would give the property owner to remove that tree. Uh, we would make every effort to work with the property owner on, on a proper timeline that we feel comfortable with. Uh, some are more, um, they need to be removed quicker than others possibly, but we'd work with, with them. And, and also I want to say it's not just removal. It could be the removal of a, a branch or other abatement options, which could be you know, some sort of treatment. So it's not always just removal. Uh, if, if the ignore, notice is ignored, uh, which we, we, this is what we don't want to do, the city shall cause the abatement of the nuisance. Uh, essentially all charges against, would be against the real estate as a special charge. Um, and that process can be lengthy. Uh, we'd rather work with the property owner to get the, uh, the nuisance abated. Uh, but it, it, uh, we do have options when it comes to that uh, if they were to ignore our, our uh, wishes. Uh, the property owner may appeal to the circuit court, essentially uh, placing a restraining order on the, uh, on the city until it goes to the court process. So that is an option that they have, and I think that was vetted out through our, our council. Is that the last slide? Um, any questions on, on this? <coughs> oh, Kristen Riley, go ahead. Thank you. Um, is this all related to trees solely, this, this whole new rewriting of this uh, ordinance? So this, the section I just spoke to, uh, 5812, right. has to do with uh, trees or, or shrubs. So I know there's another section about noxious weeds. Right. The 58.6, I'm just looking, I'm just curious about the language. Order of baby, the inspecting mm -hmm. officer determines that a public nuisance exists within the city and that there is imminent danger to the public health safety 
peace, morals, or decency. I'm trying to figure out what peace, so, morals, or decency has to do with trees. I'm wondering if it's like in The Wizard of Oz, <laughs> where those trees get angry that they're insulting the apples, they start whipping them at the, or, or what? No, it doesn't Attorney come. Dragney has a response. Yeah. <laughs> so, no, it's not all just about Even trees. trees. Yeah. Uh, we actually uh, uh, made some revisions to 58.6, which is the nuisance abatement right. provisions yeah, no. in the ordinance. And we, we modified those to make sure that they comport with mm -hmm. uh, some due process uh, requirements. Um, so uh, I don't think we tinkered with the morals language in there. Yeah, but whose who's morals who's are you referring to? It's a good question. I, hadn't, I didn't really focus on that. If you want me to dig into that, I can. But well, let's yeah. get this done, and then we can come back to the morals <laughs> issue, <laughs> if you'd like. Well, it's that whole, I because yeah. I, I, that just I, it's a weird language. Yeah, let's take, wh 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 where are you reading? Uh, it's under one, uh, C1. C1. Non-summary abatement by city. Also B1. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And by the way, I'm perfectly okay with your the tree stuff. <laughs> Yeah, the tree stuff was cool. Brett, as we're, we're looking for that, is, yeah, is I, this I, a, I, additional on trees? Is it additional? It, it's 5812 is an additional, um, an add-on to that ordinance. Uh, just Section to shore three. Up. So it, the prior sections before 5812 have to do with trees and all living beings, whereas Section 12 is just speaking for the trees. And uh, shrubs. <laughs> so. And noxious weeds. So, so noxious weeds is a, a separate. Kind of like the with the so Section 5812 is, is not applicable to humans. Correct. Okay. You can't well, just abate them. Well, okay. we, have, we have to go through the human to have it abated, yes. But it's, it's trees or shrubs. Um, yeah, and, and I uh, certainly would be um, open to I mean, if, if there's a desire to strike the reference to uh, morals or decency, which is language that appears in a couple of places <coughs> in 58.6, uh, um, I would have not, no concern with deleting those references. Yeah. I think they, I think it's kind of archaic language that's been there probably for 50 years or so. Yeah. Would, we, would we need to do that through an amendment or? Well, right, well, right now there's no motion pending, but let's say we get a motion to approve the ordinance. There could then be a motion to amend that motion to strike the morals and yeah, decency language. Yeah. Oh, we do? Yeah, we oh, do. so there could be a, an, a proposed amendment to strike that language. Right. If you I want. so moved. I, I would uh, do a motion to, uh, to strike that uh, as stated just now by our city attorney. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. A second by uh, Hiley. Okay. Any discussion on the uh, on the morals of the amendment? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. No. But Here, I'll oh, go ahead. I, I have another um, with respect to noxious weeds. I was just wondering, you list like three of them, and I was just wondering if you could also put in there Japanese knotweed because that's one that I think I meant to get back to Rodney about what is along our riverbed. Yeah. And if we're gonna take down that dam and expose a lot more soil, I would like that to be eradicated before that spreads throughout our whole nice new riverbank. <coughs> is that already defined by the Wisconsin Department of Health? I believe so. So if it is, it would be covered under this. I know, but it would be. This is on private property here, isn't it? Uh, well, it's private property. Both, right? As far as noxious weeds go, I mean, we want to be good stewards of the land too, so I think we would follow our own ordinance. It's on the, the federal list, and I'm sure it's on the state list if it's on the federal list. So I'm open to that as long as you give me the Latin name as well, because all the other ones have the <laughs> Latin. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> you got it right there. Oh my gosh, I can't say that. Mm. Renutria japonica. So, are we, are we? So, sins against morals. We have the amendment. Yeah. Do you want it? Can we just add that to that amendment, or do we need? A, yeah, I would. Um, you want to include that? I would. I would. I would 
I guess withdraw my amendment and then restate my amendment okay. to, to, mm -hmm. for the first part of it and then also to, um, to designate, what was it? To remove yeah. morals of decency and to add re nutria japonica. Okay. 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 Holly, did you get that? Ben's got to withdraw his second on that amendment. Could you, and could Holly reread re, re, re that? Are then, you willing so? to re-second it then? Yeah. Okay. So there, there's, 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 a motion, there's a motion to amend to remove the uh, the morals. The morals and decency, and to add the Japanese not, not, weed. Weed. not weed to the to the list weeds. of noxious weeds. Let the record show that Alder Borisma is against morals and decency, yeah. which I thought was interesting. <laughs> the moral part, I guess. <laughs> Okay, Still we had believes a in peace, from, though. <laughs> yeah. We had a second from all the person highly on that. Any more discussion on the amendment? All right, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? None opposed. That carries. It takes us back to the original motion as amended. Is there any more discussion? All the person bores me. I just had one question of, of Brad, and that is, um, so it says a lot about 14 days that we get, you know, you give up to 14 days for this. In, in, an, in an emergency situation, we still can, we still can deal with it right away, right? I, There's a summary abatement procedure that allows us, um, if there's an imminent danger to public health, safe, peace, safety, peace, and no longer morals of decency, uh, then the officer may, without notice or hearing, issue an order uh, requiring uh, immediate action be taken, um, and and um, if there's a failure to comply immediately, then the city can can move forward. That's if there's an imminent risk of danger. Yeah. The other procedures, uh, if there's not an imminent risk, then that's where we have time, where we uh, uh, provide time. And, and I just want to reiterate, we want to work with any property owner to get that a bit. I know there's. Uh, a cost to that and in some cases a, a hefty cost uh, so we want to make every effort to work with them to, to get that nuisance abated all right any other questions or comments all right all in favor of the motion as amended say aye aye, aye. aye. any opposed none opposed that carries. thing we have a new system in this year's budget <laughs> all right we're gonna skip down. only because we remove morals out of that that's why <laughs> lightning's about to strike uh, we're gonna jump down to item number 11 we have one more person waiting here uh, resolution 7 of 2020 <laughs> and that one comes from the comes from the plan commission so uh, all the person uh, Caravello can you introduce that one I can uh, this is resolution 7 of 2020 uh, approving a conditional use permit request by Jeb McMahon for a two flat use at 616 Ridge Street and I is there a second 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 by all the person Bartlett, all the person Caravello. Uh, this is essentially approving the two flat use uh, or returning this property, I think, to two flat use on Ridge Street. Um, it meets with our requirements and ordinances. And uh, at the public hearing at Planning. There were a few neighbors. A um, couple of them had concerns about possible negative effects on the neighborhood. Um, but one of them that was there that's been living in the neighborhood for quite a while it stated that when it was previously used as a two flat, there were absolutely no problem. So seems good. Okay. Any questions or comments on this one? 
Alderperson Reeves? I just had a question on the application, the address. I don't think the city's listed. So I wondered about that and also is just curious if this is going to be flipped or is the person that's renovating it going to continue to own it and rent it out? I'm just curious about the plan. Jeff's here. Do you want to come up and speak to it? You can introduce yourself if you'd like. Hello. Uh, my name is Jeb McMahon. Um, as far as to address the question as far as it's going to be flipped or whatever, it's an investment property for me. So uh, <coughs> depending on the time frame it's going to take to get that to be in its best value, um, then I will look to remove it from my portfolio. But that might take six months. It might take five years. I don't know. You know, as far as the work that needs to be done, uh, we're still working on getting the heating system up and running and, and some other issues uh, there uh, mm -hmm. before we even get into all the cosmetic things uh, for that property. So. And then the application, I think it had a street address, but not the city. Where Where are you from? Or where are you, where's your business out of? Uh, my hometown is Orfordville. Yes, okay. All the person, Hirsch, did you have your hand up before? Well, I have a question for the landowner that isn't related to this. Oh. <laughs> it's just... Okay. It, it'd probably be improper for me to bring it up at this time. Okay. Then we'll go to all the person Riley. Thank you. Um, just out of curiosity, what? how many bedrooms in each unit? Uh, I presume it would be rent, obviously, rental property, at least initially once you finished your work, correct? Yes. And uh, how many units in each uh, in each flat? Uh, uh, bedrooms, I should say, not units. Forgive me. Bedrooms. Uh, they're both one bedroom units. Okay. All right. Thank you. All the person reads. Um, just a couple comments that were in the memo. I think it might have been from yes, Mr. Stacy. I actually thought I think was a little misleading because it said there were no objections, but actually there were. Um, and I've had a few calls because it's in my backyard, more or less. So I've had some calls. It's in my district. Um, I also think that his assessment that not many are reverting back to single family because if you look at 3A, you know, in general, that's what we like to see in the historic districts is um, reversion back to uh, single family. Mine was reverted back to a single family. A lot of the people in the city have reverted it back, so I think that's misleading. So um, because I've had complaints, I'm going to vote no. Any other questions or comments? Uh, All the person Borisman. Yeah, I, I, I'm reading it quickly again, but um, um, when was it previously the, the two flat? I, I'm not sure. Go ahead. Go ahead, Rodney. If I can just clarify, Mr. Stacy's review letter was conducted or provided prior to the plan commission public hearing. So the, the minutes from the public hearing or the, the objection by the, the one resident was a result of that meeting. We had not been aware of any uh, prior concerns about the property prior to the letter being, the staff review letter being created. Could I, could I ask sure. my question? So when, do you know when it was previously a two-flat? Well, I think it's actually got two kitchens in it, actually. Yeah, um, it's, so it's, it's a full two. It just had not been utilized as two a two-flat flat for over a period of one year. Oh. So it lost its conforming standard to allow that to be continued, uh, therefore the need to go back through the conditional use process. Okay. Other person, Hirsch? I, I guess, Rodney, could you clarify? So it was always a two-flat, and then <coughs> somebody acquired it. Did they live it as a a single family and now going back to a two flat or was it just vacant for a year I only know that it was vacant for more than a year okay so I it's don't always been a two flat and then I can't say it was always but I know that there was a two kitchens in the in the facility for a period of time prior to his application okay. uh, in, if I can in the comments from the plan commission meeting um, a neighbor that lives up the street stated that uh, property was used for four to six years as a two flat until maybe the previous owner used the property as a single family home. So, but if you look at the, the photographs that are supplied from the front of the house, it 
it looks like it's a two flat that could be used as a single family home or I guess vice versa. Okay. Any other questions or comments? All the person Lagaki. I need to abstain on this vote. Okay. Anybody else? Hearing none, all in favor of the motion say aye. 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 And those opposed? No. And abstentions? Me. Okay. So that motion carries. Thank you. We'll go back to item number eight, which is R5 of 2020. <laughs> and this is coming from the Planning Commission, all the person Carabello. Uh, this is resolution five of 2020. Resolution by the Common Council of the City of Stoughton conditionally approving the preliminary plat of the meadows at Kettle Park West. Plan Commission approved five to zero. And I'm going to hand this to Rodney when he gets back trying to figure out what that noise is. <laughs> are you going to make a motion? Or are you uh, going to and I so move, yes, I will okay. make a motion. Is there a second? Second. Second by all the person, highly. And then uh, let us know when you're ready. Well, I'll, I'll verbally talk to it and hopefully be able to get a graphic up on the screen, but it's contained in your packet is the preliminary plat image related to this this project. Um, you'll recall it's essentially the extension of Jackson Street, Oak Opening Drive, and kind of the core center portion of the Kettle Park West development area that includes the small lot single family that's been talked about and con conveyed to the Planning Commission and the Council over the last several months. Um, the preliminary plat approval letter or pr preliminary plat Resolution outlines conditions that would have to be satisfied, would have to be satisfied um, when they bring back the final plat. So this is the preliminary plat. The next step would be to uh, satisfy the conditions of the preliminary plat resolution and bring back the final plat and the associated documents satisfying those conditions uh, for action on the final plat. Um, if the final plat is brought back in substantial compliance with the preliminary plat, it would afford the approval of a final plat action as well. You'll recognize in the resolution a number of conditions. Several of them uh, relate to specific uh, design considerations related to setbacks, um, the zoning that's anticipated as part of it, a homeowner's association requirements for uh, maintenance of the private alleys, and that those areas as identified as a condition as well we can walk through all of them but those those are the highlights of some of the conditions found within the resolution in your packet old person hirsch um i guess i'd like to amend the resolution to include what we had um discussed in our november 26 uh, meeting even though that was re in respects to TIF, but I think it would be also a good place to have this here, where we said that um, no lot south of the street that is located south of Jackson Street could be sold until Oak Opening Drive had extended to 138 or near 138 if the intersection is not complete. Um, I mean, this is something that's is from our minutes from that meeting, I guess. I was wondering if this could be added to this. Um, I think I city, the city attorney and I can talk about that slightly, but um, one of the conditions, major conditions required a, a development agreement to be put in place. Uh, we would have anticipated that to be language contained within the development agreement. Matt, do you have any opinions about whether it's included as one of the conditions on the preliminary plat? I'm, uh, I'm trying to find my draft of the preliminary plat resolution see if we put that in the, in the packet is oh, it sorry yeah. Yeah. I'd, I'd love to put it on the screen for you <laughs> that's all right we all put <laughs> earplugs in <laughs> yeah. luck, take care of the volume somehow i don't know what's going on no i have it i'm i can't i, I have it on my screen i can't okay. get it up there <laughs> technology is, is a wonderful down, thing we did it in both machines well we're looking that up is there any other questions 
Alderperson Borisman? I was at finance uh, just just before City Council, and um, I did raise an issue um, at, at finance, and that is, uh, this is called a, it's a Meadows, I think. Um, yeah, it's a Meadows at Kettle Park West. Kettle Park West. There is a Stoughton Meadows assisted living facility right down the street from it. I don't know if there's any implications whatsoever for the naming of this project, um, but uh, I just wanted people to be aware that um, we do have another Meadows uh, right on Jackson Street. So. so you're talking about the building? The building, well, yeah, the facility is called the Stoughton Meadows Assisted Living Facility. That's what it's, that's, that's as, I, as far as I know the name of it. So we have a, we have the Meadows facility right down the street from the new Meadows and, and Kettle Park. I, I, I raised it just as a concern uh, whether or not the Meadows Assisted Living folks are going to have any pro trouble with the naming of this project. I don't know, but I, I did want to raise it with, uh, okay. to let people know about it. Okay. Director Shield. And I did, I did that pass it on. I did pass it on uh, to Dennis Steincross from um, Board Development. Okay. I would suggest that the plat name generally isn't uh, an identifying feature other than maybe a landmark at the entrance to some subdivisions. Um, that's not to say your lot isn't your lot would be named based on the plat name. Um, we are particularly in tune with the address names so that it uh, emergency responses within our fire and EMS districts. So we've we've made some comments related to Aspen, for example. Aspen is another street name that's within our rural district, but within our fire department district. So uh, those types of uh, naming conventions we um, frown upon. I don't know that the one that you're raising uh, related to the plat name and a building name it raises the same level of at least emergency response concern that we we focus on. All right. Did, did you have an answer? Yes, I do. So um, the approach to the issue you've identified that that we're taking is to require that that be addressed through the development agreement. Approval of a development agreement is a condition of the resolution that is before you tonight. So when that development agreement comes back to the council, you'll be able to review that and determine whether that issue has been addressed to your satisfaction. But we, you may recall that chart that we put up where we went through the development agreement related issues and, <clears throat> and I have an outline of the development agreement on my system. That specific language is, in, is included in our, in our outline of what we want to see in that agreement. Okay. So that's how we're intending to so you don't think it's that requirement. appropriate to also put it here just so it's in multiple places to well, ensure that it's captured? If we put it there, the only thing I would do is modify the language that says that there has to be a development agreement to say that development agreement has to include, among other things, that specific requirement. Okay. Um, so we could do that if you wanted, but um, that's the status of it. No, I, I guess I feel comfortable with that being in there just so... It's captured, mm -hmm. you know. Yep. So, so we would have to amend this. So we'd have to amend the resolution. I believe it's uh, the first paragraph that requires the development agreement. Um, the, if, if you want to. Um, a developer agreement that includes. Among other things, uh, a requirement that no lot, lots located south of the unnamed east. I think the road now is actually named Alpi Alpine Run. Okay. I mean, for some reason, I think we're in Colorado as opposed to Wisconsin with this new development. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's not. It is hilly no. right there. Uh, it's it's hilly over there. I know, but the, the crossroad road is bolder. <laughs> Rod, now I want to make sure we get this right in terms of how we're defining the area because, as I recall, there was some, when we had the map up, we, were, we wanted to be careful about making sure we were clear at what lots we're talking about. The lots were all... Put it up. <laughs> yeah. How many cords you got over there anyway? None that work. Can you do a, like a uh, like a a modern dance? I don't work. Work. You're like you a Marcel Marceau. Oh, yeah. uh, mine version. So so is this gonna be can you pull up the uh, yeah. <laughs> Next best thing. So basically, we would make a motion and copy and paste the language that we had 
Although I want to just make set sure aside the, for the developer's agreement. I just want to make sure the language is right. Okay. Any other questions while we're? Uh, it is Alpine Run. Yeah. But uh, if he changes the road, more, I mean, uh, if he changes the name, I don't know if that's going to be changed. Or a little duct tape? <laughs> well, Alpine Run might work better than the as yet unnamed road. Yes, that's true. Which I think true. is what we called it before. Yes. That was the as yet unnamed road that was south of Jackson Street. I'm going to try this one. No, I need a one up way up front. It's going to take forever to load radiator fan clamps. The problem is it's, it's <laughs> look at that. There he is. That's even better. Oh, okay. Making headway. All right. So um, the intention of that motion was in the past to uh, no no lot south of this road extended. Mm -hmm. So from this Alpine Run, mm -hmm. Oak Opening Road, Oak, Oak Opening Drive is here. Alpine Run points to the south. Of that, and I think there's a public no lots south of Alpine Run extended. That's how we understood it. Yeah. Yeah. So block three and block two could not be. Well. Well, block yeah. block three is it, my interpretation. The one lot in the corner of block three would be developable. Mm-mm. It's, um, it's below. Block. This is block two. Yeah, but all, block of, these three, lots. all of block three is south of Alpine Run. It, it fronts on Alpine Run. Yeah. There's no access to Alpine Run. Do you want that one to be uh, allowed to be developed? It's going to have public improvements on the front at this point and a driveway that would come off of Alpine Run. Um, oh, it wasn't clear in the last motion, so are you su suggesting this one should not be a developable lot? Yeah, everything like block three and, and below. Oh, you're saying entire block three. Yeah, because that's, oh. that's all well, south I think that's of, of Alpine Run, which is why I understand him. Because yeah. originally we had it south of Jackson, and we compromised to Alpine Run. Yeah, and I was trying to convey what I understood to be the message on Oak Opening Drive. I did not understand any of these lots. Um, because the original because, motion because was anything south of Jackson, and then we kept on compromising to the Alpine Run South. I think somebody should just make a motion so we clarify, because I don't think it was clear. And I'd have my by blocks and the like. Otherwise, what would happen is they develop this these streets, and you wouldn't you wouldn't allow <coughs> these homes to be constructed on these. Right. Whereas here, if you terminated public improvements, for example, you then wouldn't have any frontages here. I'm, I'm just asking the question so that and There's if I could, you know, the so the the issue that led to this um, condition, as I recall, was a concern that um, Oak Opening Drive wouldn't be completed all the way down to 138. Right. So you could have kind of that area. What what's shown as Block Two, south of Alpine Run, you could have that area sitting undeveloped, without. Uh, Oak Opening Drive being extended. Well, Not that it was, was the like issue. The original that we had come up with back two years ago was anything below Jackson. But now <coughs> they've revamped this thing and we compromise as a council because we want to give them enough investment money or, you know, money to be able to build the extension to 138, we, we compromised to, instead of south of Jackson, which would have been block, you know, five, six, two, and three, we compromised it as block three and the lower half of block two. It, well, I, I guess the only thing I would say is that block <coughs> three area, the if, if all of the public improvements are installed uh, on Alpine Run and those lots are fully served by street, water, sewer, and so on, it's an onerous requirement to say you can't sell those lots, in my mind, without really... But it's a public safety... The whole thing, is it's a public safety issue of not extending it to 138. This is the whole argument, is that the more houses... And the more you build up, the, un, the, 
bigger the problem is with public safety and access into that. And that's why we as a group compromised for Alpine Drive. Before that, it was Jackson, anything south of Jackson. So I still think that we did, uh, you know, it was a nice kind of group work together to compromise on that because the, the consensus is, is that we really want that oak opening to go down to 138 for public safety issues. And if you're just saying, oh, well, we can just, doesn't mean that they can ever develop that. They just have to extend the road. And if we keep on compromising it, then we've lost our public safety issues, and I will not agree to that, and that's what our whole TIF is based on, one of the big things, and I will never go for that, because this is what we had decided on. Okay, Alder Person Jensen. Yeah, I, I just wanted to say that, that my understanding was not like that at all. My understanding was that it was from here down, three was included. In, uh, was not included in that. So it was just this four half of, the, of block two. That's what my understanding was, and that's why I voted for it. Other person, Riley. Thank you, Mayor. Um, was one of the concerns, if I recall that whole discussion that other person Hirsch and perhaps other person Mayuski had, was as if we only did it to the block two that we're talking about right now, mm -hmm. they might say, well, we don't really need that to make our money, so mm -hmm. drop dead. Mm -hmm. Wasn't that one of the concerns mm -hmm. that you had? Yep. Okay. I mean, I don't remember distinctly, honestly, if Block B was included or not. Well, expressing we, our didn't have, we didn't have but, um, street right. names back then and right. blocks back then. It was we didn't just have kind Colorado of, and Stoughton at that time. No. Yeah. Um, no, I know. So that's why I don't remember that part of the Block 3 do I did he? But I seem to recall a discussion that if we only limit it to the Block 2 that we're talking about now, there may not be sufficient impetus on the part of the developer to extend that exactly. road. They'll just abandon it and say to heck with it, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. Just Alder Person Lagaki. Question for Alder, um, uh, Alder Hirsch. Um, was this um, meeting that you're speaking of at a council meeting or at a particular um, it was a, planning commission. It was November 26th. It was our no, it was our November 26th. Yeah, yeah. it was at the in council. So it was it was in the time. it was in yes. our contract. All of those details. Yep, it's in our yeah. December yeah. 10th. The, the minutes here. Minutes. I can read out what yeah. We have. I think we can read out the minutes. That's what I was trying to get yep, at. That's what I wrote <clears> to them back then. We did not have a street name. All we said was the street south of Jackson. How it says exactly is um, no lot south of the street that is located south of Jackson Street could be sold until op opening drive is extended to 138 or near 138 if the intersection is not complete. Mm -hmm. So where we were headed with this was a motion to amend the resolution and specifically um, the the resolution up there. <coughs> Clarification on what he read. Sure. So that was just, that's where I was confused as to which meeting. Close. There isn't a, a negotiation for below Alpine. It's stated below Jackson. It's is that what I just heard? It's no. the street. But Alpine south. is below Streets. Jackson. Is what. South of the street, south of Jackson Street, which is now named Alpine. Okay. It was so never it, named last time. So it is the it, it is the area that is <laughs> south. Here's Jackson here. Yes. Here's the Jackson Alpine. <laughs> so it's everything south of Alpine. Yeah, that's this is what yeah, it's pretty straightforward. Well, so it's it's block three in that half, that southern tier of block two. Well, then we need to be very clear about the, the block two area is a little confusing about exactly. Well, because Alpine comes, well, it looked like it comes through the center of that. I don't think it goes through block oh. two. Alpine that's terminates that. Right. I think that's Alpine. Tees. So the, right now, the first paragraph of the resolution 
requires a development agreement. And um, the last sentence of the resolution of that paragraph right now says, the development agreement shall also address responsibility for maintaining stormwater management infrastructure. So it's a good question is, do you want to include an additional provision relating to this issue? And if so, what exactly do you want it to say? Well, was there other provisions in the, well, this is the main one, that based on what we just, it's in our minutes from November 26, and now that the unnamed Southern Street is called Alpine, Alpine. and I guess it has to be, you know, extended, Alpine extended through block two, which would be on that, what is it? I don't know what 915 and 910 actually mean on there, but. Those lots that correspond to that. I think those are parking lots that are within, included within those. Uh, there's probably lot numbers coming up here. So right here is your intersection with Alpine. Alpine intersects with Oak opening right here. This is part of the alley area. Yep. So I think we said below that alley. Right. Below the alley, okay. What's the name of that street at Aspen? Uh, it's Alpine. Alpine Run is the new name of it. Alpine Run and then the alley across from So, uh, Alder Harris, would you like me to read a sentence that I think you're shooting for, and then you sure. can tell me if you think I got it right? Sure. Okay. Uh, so, it would be a motion to uh, add the following to the end of paragraph one of the resolution. The development agreement shall provide that no lots locate, located south of Alpine Run or south of the alley extending across from Alpine Run may be sold or conveyed until Oak Opening Drive is constructed either to the intersection with 138, if that intersection is ready for the connection, or to the southerly boundary of the Platte, if the 138 intersection is not yet ready for the connection. Period. Did you get that, Holly? You want me to do it again? You want to read it to no me? lots located south of Alpine <coughs> Run or the alley south of Alpine Run may be sold or conveyed. Whoop, whoop, stop there. South of Alpine Run or south of the alley located across from Alpine Run. Or south of the alley located across Oak Opening Drive from Alpine Run. That again, won't you, would you? Yes. No lots south of Alpine Run or the alley across Oak Opening Drive from Alpine Run. <laughs> These alleys have Alpine names Run. too. Which alley is it here? Mm -hmm. Trisel South. <laughs> I can't, what is it? Is so it B two O L one? Yeah, I don't know what that alley. I have no idea what that action means. Block two O L one. Or B two outlaw one. Of, get rid of the. <laughs> or south. Do you have a question, all the person Borisma? Yeah, I just I, mean, I guess I'd like to ask <coughs> directly of Regina. Um, your main objection to. I mean, I know, I know we had agreed to something different in the past, but what is your main objection to not allowing those lots to be sold or developed? Again, Sid, unfortunately, because you sat out of our long discussion that day, you know, oh, it would have yeah, yeah. hurt. 
heard it, but um, it's again, it's a public safety issue to have that access to 138. You yourself said that right. it's a better design of a neighborhood to have that access to 138. And so we feel like the more you build on that southern part of Jackson, the more congested it's going to be and the more of a public safety issue yeah. it's going to be. Yeah, the, the, the issue is has been for a couple of years now for opening access to 138. I mean, right, it's just, right. we keep going into that and... and that's why it was decided, mm -hmm. the whole council was unanimous once we kind of compromised on Alpine Drive. I started at Jackson and we compromised at Alpine mm -hmm. Pond. And so that's why I want to make sure it's captured. Yeah, the whole idea was is to ensure that the road went all the way through to 138. So at the point where we decided what type of intersection would be there, the connection would be easily made. Yeah. So at the point where, and one final question for Regina, at the point that Oak Opening Drive connects to 138, you're, you would anticipate that that whole section then be saleable and buildable? Yep. Right. Because it gets rid of the public safety yeah. issue. Right, it, it eliminates itself. But if we had an opening, if we had oak opening it's attached to 138, there wouldn't be even a no. problem with this discussion. Right. Exactly. The next day, and we identified the path that we thought were included. Okay, I think we got the language. We, okay. If you want the clerk to read it again, yeah. Uh, so the motion was to well, add the following language. I'm, I'm having a little trouble with this because it's at the point where, okay, so we're going to have to come back to this whole plot, uh, plan. Uh, when Oak Opening Drive does connect to 138, then we'll, we'll have to redo that. No. That, no. The road will be there. No. We just have to determine what kind of intersection is going to be made and then by then either the DOT will pay for it or there'll be enough increment there to pay for, no, for the what, connection. What, I think what, what Sid's saying is, Sid, what happens is we, don't, we, won't have to re, we will not have to revisit this again and, and change the plat because all it's, it's saying is that right. in the agreement for this plat to, to happen, that as part of that agreement, this stipulation must be fulfilled. Yeah, and or to say that when when that oak opening drive gets attached to 138, that then that that, that that's already stated in that. Then it statement. would be then it would be buildable and saleable. Mm -hmm. that's, yeah. that's already that's yeah. that's built into that statement. And that's how we should yeah that's how. Yeah. And that's what we thought we had when we were going through the developers agreement, but there was a little bit of a confusion as far as exactly which lots were included in that and what we're trying to do is clarify that right and and i i think it's a great incentive for the developer to you know again and, and for the city hopefully the developer council. agrees with you for the for i mean it's a great incentive for having those be come saleable lots after right really but the, I think we all have the same goal here. At the end of this thing, everything's going to be developed all the way down to 138. That's the goal. Mm -hmm. So we have the language. So yep. yeah, the language. I, I won't read the exact language, but the way it's drafted, what it would what it would require is development agreement will not would if this amendment is approved. The development agreement would have to prevent the sale of any of those lots that we've been talking about as block free which are the lots along Alpine Run, and any of the lots south of the alley that extends across from Alpine Run, none of those lots could be sold until Oak Opening Drive is extended to uh, Highway 138 by the developer. Right? Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. They've raised <coughs> all of those. Yep. They okay. Let's go. Okay. So that's, that's uh, an amendment to the motion. Yeah, man. 
And that's by Alderperson Hirsch, is that correct? Mm -hmm. and was there a second? Second. Second by Alderperson Riley. Any questions on the amendment? One question sure. for Matt. Now, Matt, that language or, or something about <coughs> like that is already in your documents that you were looking well, I already had a provision in the outline that we are working with for the development agreement okay. that required this type of a restriction. The, 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 the confusion was, did it apply to those lots up by Alpine Run or only the other lots going down there? So, so with this, then, you now have an understanding of what... If, if this motion is adopted, it's very clear. It includes okay. all those lots along Alpine Run as well. So, it would, it, even if it wasn't adopted, it would, it, it would, if it was not adopted, it would, you would still have a clear direction, though, as to what, what the understanding of the council uh, was. If it's not adopted, um, then I think I would still ask the council to give me direction on okay. exactly how you want that to, to be okay. addressed. Okay. Is that how you understood it, Dennis? I don't know what you're he you want us to put all of Alpine Run in and we can't sell any of the lots on the south side of it? That's exactly mm -hmm. right. Well, or you could turn the... I'm sorry. I'm not going to do that. I guess that. I'm not coming tonight. Sure. Well, okay. Yeah. If we don't do that, then we're going to put uh, temporary culvert packs on the end of all those trees coming down there? I guess. And, and that was our, uh, our concern when we discussed this at a stop level was that um, it, it didn't make sense to us to prohibit the sale of the lots on Alpine Run if they're going to build those that street and put in that infrastructure. But again, it's up to you guys. No, the whole thing is about getting Oak opening to 138. Once that's done, hey, you can sell all those lots. It's just making hmm. sure that that road gets done, and there's no <coughs> scrimping in this development. It's for our community, and it's a public safety issue. Um, like I said, we can go, we compromise from Jackson Street down to Alpine Run. So I think we did a great job. Okay. Any other questions or comments on the amendment? Um, all those in favor of the amendment, say aye. 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 And any opposed to the amendment? No. no. Uh, the ayes have it. And, uh, and I'll, I will abstain from this one. Okay. We we'll catch you. So I think it was 9 2 1. Is that right? Mm -hmm. uh, so the amendment passes, which takes us back to the original motion on the preliminary plat. Any questions on that as amended? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? None opposed. That carries. Item number nine is R6 of 2020, and that comes from the Plan Commission, and that's uh, regarding uh, a certified survey map. Alder Person Caravello. Uh, this is Resolution 6 of 2020, a resolution by the Common Council of the City of Stoughton conditionally approving a certified survey map associated with Kettle Park West, and I so move. Second. Second by all the person Riley, all the person Caravello. Um, and basically, I'm just going to throw this at Rodney again, if that's OK. Similarly to the preliminary plat, this is related to the area to the south where Oak Opening Drive would be extended to Oak Opening or to State Highway 138. The conditions of the resolution are outlined um, in the in the document uh, prohibiting sale of parcels on lot one until that connection is made. Do we have to amend it now to make sure yeah. that it reflects what we just discussed? I don't think so. I'm just I'm going to it though to take okay. a peek. All the person boards with that was my question and, and whether or not that has to be amended based on what we just passed. So apparently not. I'm just taking a look. I don't think it does. Well, that's uh, going to change, right? Well, lot one is. is so uh, th th there is a condition that requires that. Um, Outlot one be dedicated uh, to the city as public right of way. Um, but with the condition that you already attached to the plat, mm -hmm. 
that already prohibits the sale of any of those lots in the plat until oak opening is extended to 138. So I don't think you need to impose that at same condition again. Okay, I just here. didn't know if it, you had to be consistent or... Item I, 3 does already. Item 3 in the resolution does. <sighs> Indicates that development <laughs> agreement <laughs> prohibits the sale of... Oh, lot, yeah. Well, that's a different lot, though. But, but yeah, oh. that lot... Yeah, because yeah. that's lot 1, which is not... What is, what's lot 1, Rodney? That's lot lot one, what is... Lot one is the large lot oh. that would have residential units built on it. And so net... Uh, lot, lot one is this large parcel here. That's where the residential units would be built. Condition three says you, the development agreement has to include language that that can't be sold for lots until such time the connection is made to State Highway 138, correct? Correct. That, that's condition number three. Uh, three in the resolution now. Right. That lot one cannot be sold um, or developed until the intersection at 138 is completed. But how does lot one fit in with the other the lot map one is, that lot we one just is, looked at? Because it's, it's not, south of it's Alpine south. Valley. <laughs> Alpine Valley. Okay. South of Alpine Run. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because it's... it's Kind of trying to figure out where that is. It's where the duplexes would go, if you remember the previous maps. So I, I, I think this is where this discussion is kind of um, migrated from. Recall the CSM area is <coughs> on the very southern tip of this. That's where that lot. So there was never any disagreement that there wasn't going to be any sale on those lots. During the meeting in November, the discussion was um, about not having any of these parcels built on. I pointed out that in, in lieu of having temporary cul-de-sacs, in my opinion, it made sense to allow for uh, lots north of Alpine Run um, to be constructed and built. Right, and it, that's where we can't it, Yep, compromise. and during that point, I don't know that it was clear about the lots you just clarified in the last motion. Certainly the, the intent of at least what I stated was um, in recognition of the areas on Oak Opening Drive along this corridor would no longer be. Obviously the CSM area, no, uh, but then my understanding of what I described last time was lots on Oak Opening Drive south of that area would not be allowed. So well, it's good that we clarified it then tonight. Yeah. So back to the question, the question was, this, does this affect um, the CSM? And the answer is no. Is that correct? CSM resolution already addresses the okay. issue, I think, in the way right. that So is want. everybody good with that understanding? Mm -hmm. yes. Any other questions? Hearing mm -hmm. none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? None opposed. Item 10 is a discussion of possible action regarding recommendation from the Common Council to the Planning Commission to prepare an amendment to the TIF project plan for Kettle Park West Phase 2, the Meadows. So basically, um, we put this on here. We'd like the Council to give the Planning Commission their blessing to start that process. And there were some additional materials that were requested in your packet, and we can certainly go through the materials if you'd like us to kind of outline what this process looks like but in a nutshell the project plan that's required through the TIF process that needs to ultimately be approved by the Joint Review Board the original project plan we did was only for phase one so now that we're entering into phase two we have to amend that project plan to include everything that would be um, part of the phase two and certainly if you want to get into deeper detail um, we can do that what is your preference well, go ahead i would like either myself or somebody else to present the motion so we can actually talk about this okay you want to present it yeah i i can i can present it to the um i, I move that we um prepare we ask that the um, 
city staff prepare an amendment to the TIF project plan for Kettle Park West Phase to the Meadows. Um, it would go through the Planning Commission. Through the Planning Commission, correct. Okay. Is there a second? Sure. Second. Second by Alderperson Jensen. And did you want to elaborate, or you want uh, no, Jamie no, can I, certainly I, walk through it if you I want just, him to? Yeah, I think I think I would like to at least see it. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. So th this stuff actually isn't required as part of the the project plan amendment. We just wanted to get ahead of the plan commission. The plan commission could go ahead and start this process, but basically, TIFs are the creature of a council. And you have the ultimate approval power at the end of the day once we go through Joint Review Board, Plan Commission, and everything. Um, City Council still can vote this down. So we wanted to get you the list of projects in front of you um, just to make you aware that this is the, the path that we think we would go with this project plan just so you, there were no surprises and we want to hear any objections you may have to these. At the end of the day, it doesn't bind us to doing any of this work. We can just do it if we choose to do it at some point in time. Alder Person Jensen. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Um, read through this when we got the information in the amended uh, packet, and um, I guess my only question would be for uh, President Mayeski, if you wouldn't mind. Um, I'm assuming you've had a chance to look through this. Do you find any anything uh, objectionable, or do you feel that this will help the uh, Planning Commission? Hopefully, it'll help the Planning Commission. Hopefully, since we're both on there. Yep. As are others. Mm -hmm. Other person, Legaki. Question on process then. So, if we were to uh, approve Sid's amendment, uh, Sid's suggestion, Planning Commission would go forward and then sort of keep us apprised as we this happens and then ultimately this would come to Council for a vote? Yes. Yeah, so, the, the checklist is attached to the memo. There's multiple moving parts with this process so you have the plan commission part you have the joint review part and ultimately it comes to council there's public hearings involved there's publications involved i mean that's there's a lot of moving parts parts once you head down this road but ultimately the city council can say yes or no once all the work is done but we didn't want to put all the work in in terms of getting the joint review board together having the plan commission do a bunch of work obviously forward development city staff ellers would all be involved in this um, so there'd be some dollars involved too and some time. We don't want to go down this road unless you had a feel for what the projects were that we were planning on putting in the project plan. But again, some of them we would we would tie ourselves to through the phase two process and the developer's agreement and everything that we talked about back in November. The other ones are looking forward, you know, maybe 10 years from now in terms of extending water utility, um, some road work, things like that, that, hey, we may as well get it in the project plan. So if we decide to do it someday and there's enough revenue within that TIF, we can do it without having to amend the plan again. If we don't get it in the project plan now, we can't do it. Yeah. Okay. So we're opening the door. We're opening the door is all we're doing with this, yes. All the person bores And that was the purpose of my, my amendment, and that is to get the, the, the um, planning commission is going to have to get started at some point and, and um, this, this allows them to get started I think with the project plan. Sure. Mm -hmm. President Mayeski. I was just going to tell Alder Lugaki that um, just because this is starting doesn't necessarily mean it's approved for anything. Gosh no. They, they're, they're sort of asking for a blessing to get going. Yeah. To, to get going so we could possibly stop them. If, if that's what, what the council would wish. Yep. Any other questions or comments? Um, Here, none. All in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 Any opposed? None opposed. Uh, Eleven. We did twelve. Um, this is coming from the finance committee. All the person Jensen. No, I'll take it. Or Schumacher. I read to it. Yeah. R eight two thousand and twenty. R eight twenty twenty authorizing and directing the proper city officials to enter into an agreement with Speedway Sand and Gravel Inc. For the bioswale to wet detention conversion project, so moved. Second. Second, uh, second by Jensen. All the person Schumacher. 
All right, so this is on South Academy Streets and East Streets, and uh, like it says, converting the bioswale to wet detention, um, and to improve the water quality and the flow of the water within that area. Um, this is partially supported by grants from the DNR, and the bid was quite a bit under budget of what we had for that. Oh. Anything you want to add, Director Shiel? Yeah, um, the original estimate was approximately 300,000. It came in under under that, so uh, we're pleased with the, the two bids that we received. Speedway Sand and Gravel has done work in the city before and seems capable to handle this project for us this, this summer. Okay, questions or comments? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? None opposed. Um, next item is consideration of possible action regarding Stafford Rosenbaum conflict waiver regarding the town of Dunn EMS contract. Attorney Dragney, you want to just? Yeah, our firm, one of my partners, uh, Chris Hughes, has a uh, long standing relationship with the town of Dunn, has done work with them over the years. Uh, we were asked to review uh, contracts that the city has with um, all of its partners with respect to EMS, one of those being the town of Dunn. Um, and so we needed to get both the town of Dunn and the city of Stoughton to decide whether to allow us to review that agreement, um, um, notwithstanding the fact that um, my partner Chris has historically done work with the town. If we do, if, if the, uh, so the town has already approved the waiver. If the city approves it, we, we, we would be, and we already have, reviewed the contract on behalf of the city but not on behalf of the town. And we've done this in different situations. Um, so I'm looking for a motion. I'll make a motion to approve the waiver. Second. Second by all the person highly. Any questions or comments? All the person Just a question. Do you you see any any ethical or problem with with this? Or? Uh, this is the procedure that <laughs> the Code of Ethics uh, <laughs> lays out for lawyers. Uh, so you don't care. <laughs> the, uh, so the issue for me is I have to make a judgment about whether I can competently advise the city on this matter, notwithstanding the fact that my partner has this relationship with the town of Don. I've made the decision that I can, but you have to make the ultimate decision whether to approve that. And, and will, it, will she be working on this? Uh, Chris is a he, and he will not be working on this. Oh, he. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yep. Questions or comments? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? None opposed. Thank you. Our 9 of 2020, this one is coming from finance, and it's, finance actually met on this one. It was actually November 12th <coughs> of last year. Um, this is coming from all the person Schumacher. All right, our 9 2020. Authorizing and directing the proper city official to enter into contracts covering calendar years 2020, 21, and 22 for emergency medical services with the following townships Dunkirk, Dunn, Pleasant Springs, and Rutland. So move. Second. Second by, was it Alderperson Reeves? Yes. Okay. Any discussion? Alderperson Schumacher. This is uh, contracts that are. All replacing the existing uh, the expired now 2019 contracts um, nothing much is changing as far as the wording goes in it it's pretty close to what the contracts were prior um, just the the monies are different for the different years just increasing from year to year questions or comments from others there are none all in favor say aye aye, aye. aye. any opposed None opposed, that carries. Uh, the last item actually didn't go through the committee, uh, but we are asking uh, for approval on an agreement with the town of Run Rutland to make improvements to Oak Opening Drive and Deer Point Drive within the township. And this would be um, as part of our, as required in the developer's agreement that we're working on. Um, so I'm looking for a motion to begin that conversation. I don't think so. Okay. Motion by Riley, is there a second? Second. Second by, was it Caravello? Okay. Anything you guys want to add to this one, Rodney? Uh, this agreement is the agreement that would be conveyed to the town. We 
haven't initiated discussions, formal discussions with them at this point. We wanted an endorsement from the council before doing so related to the scope of the document. Oak Opening Drive uh, in the town of Rutland and Deer Point Drive are still intended to remain town roads, uh, rural cross sections. The proposed improvements would widen the pavement width on either side by five feet. Um, and it would still have the rural cross section with the ditches on the sides. As part of the TIF um, improvement plan, the city would proceed with that improvement following the roundabout construction as planned for 2021 at Roby Road and 51. Um, that seems to be the logical time to actually do that. That way the condition of that roadway would be brought up to a, a new roadway or newer roadway condition after that, the completion of that roundabout. If everything comes together, uh, Oak Opening Drive and Jackson Street, uh, the extension of Jackson Street to Oak Opening and North might actually provide an ex alternative route to those rural businesses during the construction of the roundabout. So if, if Kettle Park West project moves as, as anticipated, um, we think that'll be a benefit, but this will resurface and repave that area and that rural section in the town of Rutland in 2022 or thereafter doesn't define exactly. We, we need to have the TIF increment coming in, as we've indicated, uh, in order to fund that effort, but it's anticipated to occur at, at a point of 2022 or thereafter. Thank you. Any questions or comments? Who wants to go first? I was going to ask about the finance not getting to this. Uh, whether there were concerns with that. It wasn't presented to the Finance Committee. Okay. Yeah, yeah. This wasn't on agenda. It was something that is required in the developer's agreement, so we just brought it right here. That uh, way we could worry. begin the discussion. This isn't really finalized as of yet, but we're hoping that once we sit down with them, it will be. Did you have a question, all the person looked at That, as well as why why it was not at finance, so that was never the plan. Yeah. Does this come back since this is not final, it according wouldn't. to what you just said? It would not. It, if there isn't any recommended changes coming out of the dialogue with the town of Rutland, it would not need to come back to the committee. Um, I think the reason internally it didn't go to the finance committee is because it was an item of mutual concern or interest for the entire council. Um, and internally we talked about whether it made sense to or ne needed to go to finance first or if it could just proceed directly to council in light of the preliminary plat discussion and the other items on the agenda tonight. And this agreement is similar to what we have on 138 with the DOT. Um, so it really, you know, this one takes it a step further where we actually complete the work. Um, but we have to have an agreement since it's really, you know, in the township and not in the city. It's their road, not ours. So unless there's something specific um, in the agreement that you want to discuss, um, we're hoping to move forward. And just wanting sure. to clarify, there is no fiscal impact to our city since this is theirs. Um, correction, <laughs> there is. This is part of a, an off-site. Um, off, uh, it's not part of the on-site improvements planned for the Kettle Park West. It's considered an off-site improvement. As part of the TIF discussion, you recall, this was identified as an off-site improvement that would be made once increment was available. The city would fund and proceed with this work. Um, with that if, funding, if the, if the TIF is approved, and and if the increment is available to do the work, right, so it won't be coming out of the CIP. Nope. And if all of those conditional things happen, do we have a sense of what is the potential fiscal impact to the TIF? Just say it. Six hundred and ninety thousand dollars. Any other questions or comments? All the person Hirsch. Um, if the roundabout is being put in in 2021, and I know we need the increment to put this in, could it? Could we change the language to be, you know, between 2021 and 2022 if the increment involved? I mean, I'd hate to have to wait a whole other year after the roundabout to put in if we have the money to put it in sooner. Um, well, logistically, I don't think we want to be constructing the this improvement at the same time the roundabout is being improved right i was so, thinking it'd be like right after so you're just saying as soon as that 
the roundabout is done, then we can yeah. work on that. And, and you know, TIF, the and the TIF projections anticipate it to be probably the 2022 horizon oh, okay. as well. Yeah, and if, if they do the roundabout, and, well, they're going to do it in 2021. We don't know if it'll be in the spring or summer or late fall. We okay. just don't, right. at this point, we don't know that answer. If it was done in the spring and we we're in a position to do it, I would think we would consider moving forward with it. Um, but we just don't know. All right. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? None opposed? Move to, Move to adjourn. Second. Motion by Jensen, the second by Harley. Any discussion? Hear none. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? None opposed. Thank you. <laughs>